think the most, I mean, what was most important to me and, and thankfully Scott was that, y y you know, that the way um, to approach the film, the way to approach the character was not, was not as a criminal or not as a, you know, um, evil or any of that stuff because I don't, you know, I don't think there's any one of us who are, there, there's probably a few evil people here. <laughs> you do work in Hollywood, I've been, right? I've been called evil. <laughs> it, just to, to, to not approach uh, Jimmy as a as a, a criminal per se, or you know, because none of us wake up in the morning and shave or brush our teeth thinking, I'm going to go out and absolutely destroy people. Um, wanted to see. I, w I, w I wanted to see the human side of that. I wanted to. Uh, understand that there was a great difference between um, his life and the people that he loved and the people that he was loyal to, the people that he truly had that traditional Irish immigrant um, bond um, and love for his, for his mother, love for his brother, um, and that the other side was business, you know, business is business, and it just so happens that his business um, required uh, a great deal of violence because uh, it's the only way to stay on top. And um, so, yeah, I, I, it wasn't like I was trying to glorify any of his um, actions, but just to give the opportunity to see a, a human being as opposed to just this, you, you know, just. He's a multifaceted uh, individual, uh, well, Mr. Bulger. So um, I, that's really what Scott and I talked about. And yeah. Otherwise, it's 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 too easy for an actor to come in and just play one color of mm -hmm. uh, venality or one color of violence. So Johnny really approached him as, okay, this is a human being who happens to be cold and cunning and calculating, but also very tender with moments with Dakota's character, uh, with his humorous with his mother. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise. Um, it trivializes everything that occurred in Boston because there's so many emotional scars in that city that really have yet to, to heal. That every day Johnny and I would go to set, we would always say there are victims and victims' families, so we cannot in any way make this feel like uh, an overt movie in which we're glamorizing or glorifying them. Those moments with Julianne uh, are extremely menacing, mm -hmm. and the moments with Dakota are extremely tender until that moment uh, in the kitchen uh, of the, or the cafeteria of the hospital in which we see how he begins to turn. Right, Dakota, I wanna ask about that scene. That's obviously the death of the son is something that I guess for the first time, Jimmy can't control. He is not a master of. Um, and it's also one of the few times that somebody stands up to him. Um, can you talk a little bit about the scene in the hospital uh, and how important it is in terms of what it reveals about Jimmy and about, about your character and somebody who can stand up to him in this horrible moment of heartbreak? At that point, their child was still technically alive, although on life support. And so there's a time when thus far, basically, he's he's been a completely different person with her. And, and it's kind of been private. And it's only they she sees a side of him that nobody else gets. And he's been good to her and, and, the, and wonderful to their child. And then the minute that she shows you know, a, a sort of, I feel like in in moments, in, in, in experiencing trauma, profound psychological changes happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he turns on her and it's, it's like the, just the darkest side of him because until then it's been, it's been only, you only see peace when they're together. Uh, I want to come back to the scene with Julianne upstairs. Uh, David, I want to talk about the way in which that scene was cut. Um, it's, there's not a lot of cutting in that scene, actually. We see a lot of, of Johnny's hands on Julianne's face. Can you talk about the editing in that scene, then we'll talk a little bit about the score in it. Well, there's, um, I think in the editing room, one of the things we talk about, it's, it's a lot easier to cut than it is not to cut. Uh, <laughs> so with performances, and, and by the way, Julianne wasn't the only one who was surprised 
uh, when Johnny came through the door in that scene because I wasn't there on the set that day. It's not written that way. So when I sat down the next day and saw the dailies, I was, and I watched Julianne's take first. Um, and there weren't a lot of takes. I mean, this, but it was, it, it was frightening. It was horrifying. And I kind of thought, well, there's nothing, there's no way to cut away from this. I mean, it's just what's going on there. But then on the other side, you do have Johnny Depp, the star of the movie, and so you know you're going to have to go there at some point. So it was just trying to find the right moment where you could possibly go away from Julianne. Uh, when uh, Scott asked me to come down and, and uh, see the film, uh, I had a... I had a flu and I, I'm in, in somniac also, so I didn't sleep for many, many nights in a row. And I come in at nine o'clock, I see this film, and I got out by 11 and my hands were sweating and my, my, my legs were uh, trembling. And I was supposed to meet the, the two of you actually after that. And I, the meeting was very short. I was like, okay, I need to collect myself and I'll let, let's call in later this afternoon. But by that time I got so inspired um, and I said to Scott, let me write a, a theme or something, and then I'll send it to you. And if you like it, I, I, if you recognize your movie on this, I'd love to work with you on this. It got a little out of hand. It became 45 <laughs> minutes. Uh, and uh, it's it the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I, I just got on this really <laughs> weird trip. It's like, oh, we need to do this. We need to do that. And, and the nights got shorter. The days got longer. But I got more <laughs> and more inspired. The flu disappeared, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I, I sent it out to Scott and I said, like, hey, do you recognize your movie in this? And uh, you called me back within an hour, uh, two hours. And uh, so a lot of the material that was written was, was in this 45 minutes. And the things that were in there were um, uh, anger, uh, paranoia, very tender uh, sweetness, and, um, and also very emotional music. And... The point from that point on was like between um, Scott, me, and David was was the dynamic is like okay, where do you uh, restrain on, mu on on music and and you to avoid to put a hat on a hat, you know, which is, which is very hard to do with 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 movies like this because the acting is so incredibly strong, um, and that took you know quite some uh, experimentation. John Lesher, this was a project that was in development for a number of years, and then something happened in 2011, in June of 2011, that changed its trajectory. What happened, and how did that change this, this project? Uh, they found Whitey Bulger hiding <laughs> in Santa Monica. Not far um, from here, five miles from here. Not that far from here. And um, yeah, it was, I, it was always this thing that I thought would be cool, but as we all t it, it felt like we were just missing so much information. Um, and a, even a third act or something, or just something that, and s from the moment they found him and then through the trial, not only did it il uh, illuminate so much more information on what these guys were all up to and what the FBI was up to and everything, but it also, it gave us the kind of impetus and the energy to go make the movie and the ability to go get people like Scott and Johnny and everyone that's sitting, all these amazing people that worked on it. We have just an amazing crew that worked on this movie from top to bottom and our cast is, so anyway, th thanks to Scott who put this together. How did you discover Whitey? Was it a process? Was it gradual? Was there some sort of epiphany? And how important was the wardrobe and makeup in that discovery? They go hand in hand for me, you know. Um, <clears throat> just like wardrobe can be um, like a, a suit of armor in a way, it, can, it, it, it almost dictates how you stand. Or, you know, it'll change your posture or... Um, so things s start to come into play. Um, the the makeup, um, the prosthetics. Uh, I've, I've been working for many many years with um, uh, a, a, an amazing makeup artist, uh, especially with prosthetics. Um, a guy named Joel Harlow, who um, yeah. yeah, amazing Indeed. work, amazing. <laughs> and and Joel is a. Um, Perfectionist, and 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 you know he started making these sculptures, and uh, you know, sculpting pieces and whatnot. And we did about five or six tests until um, we both looked at it and thought, yeah, that's uh, that's him, you know, that's him, and showed it to Scott and whatnot, and and uh, we moved forward. But having you know wearing wearing the pieces and knowing that it was. 
it did allow me to to transform um, uh, physically, uh, and, and also you know I mean the, the, there's there's some surveillance footage on on uh, Jimmy Bulger. We see at the end of the film. Yeah, the, and yeah, exactly. And there's not there's not much else really, and uh, there's very little audio uh, uh, of him. Uh, so I, I just kind of. Uh, I listened to, I talked to, I spoke to a lot of people in Southie who were former associates, and I, um, I was able to glean a lot of information. I spoke to his attorney, who was very clear, a guy named Jay Carney, who's a wonderful, wonderful guy. He, I went to him. I requested a meeting, if possible, with uh, Jimmy uh, Bulger, and um, he had respectfully declined, um, as he wasn't. Uh, particularly enthusiastic about this book or any book that's been written on him, <coughs> as you can imagine. I think he's writing his own book. That's what I've heard. Uh, uh, the sequel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, Jay Carney was very upfront. He said, listen, I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, expose my client in any way, but so I'm not giving you this much, but I can give you this much with regard to personality, with regard to thoughts, with regard to, you know, many, many things. And um, so th those people were very helpful. But Joel Harlow really was the key um, to finding Whitey for me. I, I just want to add, because Johnny is far too humble to, mm -hmm. to ever say this, but, and I, I have said this whether Johnny is on the stage or not, I know Johnny really, really well, and he is one of the most generous and soft-spoken and soulful men that I've ever met. So then... <laughs> Johnny always physically transforms for his parts. Uh, whether, exactly, whether it's uh, Sweeney Todd or it's Ed Wood or it's Ed... S yes, please. And the truth is, I knew we would get that right. Test after test after test. That, that wasn't an issue. But seeing Johnny go from very soulful and quiet and gentle man, to the man that you have just seen, mm -hmm. is mesmerizing. Not only as the film's director, but as just a fan. Because when he came to set, I didn't see Johnny Depp. Only very frequently, or infrequently, would I actually maybe go by his trailer after a long day, and then all of that would be gone, and I would say to myself, oh my God, I'm actually directing Johnny Depp. Mm -hmm. I've heard Scott say, and John, um, it couldn't have been filmed anywhere else. To walk no, those streets, did. to be surrounded by those people, to tell that story, you can't do it anywhere else. I saw Crazy Heart, and I saw uh, Jeff Bridges, who is obviously a brilliant, brilliant actor and is capable of so much. But what I saw in Jeff Bridges was so brave and so, and, and the only way that one can arrive at that arena is because you have a director who's brave and uh, is open to, like I said, the idea of chance. And Scott and I, I mean, talked about working together. I was desperate to work with the guy. And man, beyond anything I've ever experienced, I've, n I, I've just never, I've never experienced a director like this. He doesn't allow the audience to to, to feel the camera, to notice the camera. He makes the camera breathe as if it's another person. You never really notice. It's not like these fancy kind of shots. I mean, he, he would do huge, huge scenes with a lot of people in a wonder, and it was so freeing and so magnificent to play that because you have this extended period of time where it's almost like, you know, you've got seven minutes of a play almost. It blew me away, I'm thinking, this is this guy's third film, man. <laughs> it's his third film. And he's a master. Like, he's a master. He really is, man. <laughs> Truly. And um, if, if phone books still existed, <laughs> I, I would shoot, I would film the phone book with the man. 